So my name is Brendan Teeling. I'm the founder and director of the Dublin Festival of History. I work for Dublin City Libraries. Our speakers today are Ian McGregor and Jane Freeland. Ian is a successful editor of nonfiction for major public ha- publishing houses, uh, working with uh, sports stars, uh, some of our own <laughs> included, uh, and some talented and best-selling historians such as Michael Wood, uh, Simon Shanna, William Taubman, Alice Roberts and John Nicol, as well as publishing tie-ins with archives and podcasts, including uh, Radio 4's uh, Time. He's also a writer and public speaker on modern history, and Ian is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Jane Freeland is an historian of feminism and gender in modern Germany at the German Historical Institute in London. And without further ado, uh, let me hand you over to Ian and Jane. Uh, enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so I've had the pleasure of reading uh, this book over the past few weeks, and I'm really looking forward to talking to Ian about it today. But before we talk about the book and uh, some of the people discussed within it, I'm gonna hand it over to Ian, who's going to um, give us sort of an overview of the of the wall of division of Germany. So Ian, over to you. Thanks, Jane. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this talk. Uh, I normally give an hour's talk uh, with lots and lots of slides and, and embedded video on uh, how the Berlin Wall came about and the life of the Berlin Wall and the people that populated it. But obviously, this is a more conversational presentation. So I've stripped it right back just to give some very, very basic information about uh how I uh, uh, wrote this book about Checkpoint Charlie. So the, on the right hand side, obviously, this is what Checkpoint Charlie looks like uh, today. Uh, thankfully, minus the reenactors who have now been banned by uh, the council fathers, which I think is a great move. Uh, it'd be it'd be even better if they got rid of some of the uh, the fast food shops and souvenir shops, but they, you can't have everything at the moment. But I have called the subtitle uh, the most dangerous place on earth because at, at the time it was uh, the only place at, uh, at that period when the Berlin Wall was about to go up and then went up that both Soviet and allied predominantly American forces faced each other over a very short distance of space uh, with weapons, whether they were obviously uh, machine guns or generally, as we've seen with the famous tank standoff, tanks locked and loaded. Uh, and it was like the pressure cooker. So as, as, as you can see on the left hand side, that's how it looked uh, in 1961. This is after the, the wall had gone up. Uh, and this is during that famous tank standoff where you've got all the various organs of state on both sides, West and East Berlin. And you've got the uh, the allies we can see in the foreground there by Checkpoint Charlie, the basic hut. And, and way off in the distance, that's where these Germans were with their Soviet backers and Soviet tanks. So. This is what I was trying to capture in the book, and I interviewed, as Jay, Jay and I will, will expand upon, a lot of people, over 80 people, uh, from all walks of life uh, and from the nationalities that are a core to this story, uh, French, British, American, uh, Soviet, obviously, and then East and West Germans, uh, and it took it was three years in the making. So uh, quickly, very quickly, how we got here was on the right hand side, you can see the map as it looked from about 1954, 55, uh, where you've got that really hard uh, black line, the hard uh, of the inter-German border cutting its way through to show where East and West Germany met. So obviously by 1949, they were both then republics. There was the Federal Republic of Germany in the West and the German Democratic Republic uh, in the East, which the Allies still hadn't recognized by the time the, the wall went up. They didn't see it as a sovereign state. Uh, and what we can see too is obviously, even though you've got the Western sectors and they would, uh, they would obviously formulate into the FRG, what we still had was the, the big issue, which is why the Berlin Wall went up, was uh, Berlin itself, 100 miles deep inside East German territory. Uh, which was and had been agreed upon uh, to be an international city. So as Germany itself had had the, uh, the four occupational powers dissect the country and have their own zones of occupation, it was mirrored in Berlin itself, a capital city. And so there were four occupational zones uh, there. And obviously, as we're progressing very, very quickly through time, as I said, so we're now in the 1950s, uh, that has shown that uh, the Allies are there to stay. They weren't going to move. The Berlin airlift in 48-49 had been one move to try and force them out of the city because 
as Stalin had done up until his death, and then his replacement, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was in charge when the Berlin Wall went up, wanted to do too. They both wanted, uh, they didn't mind a unified Germany, but they wanted a neutralized unified Germany, uh, one that would never be a threat again to, the, to themselves or their, their eastern zones that they had now set up with their satellite states of control. Uh, and one that obviously the Allies would then, if it was neutral, would have to retreat from, so there wouldn't be an armed, uh, militarized, I should say, strong West German uh, state, which is exactly what they ended up with from 1949 onwards. So by the early 1950s, uh, West Germany had been uh, entered into NATO, uh, just as much as East Germany was occupied by uh, hundreds of thousands of Russian troops and thousands of tanks and aircraft. So West Germany was too. So much as the country itself on both sides was one massive uh, military theater, if you shrink that down to size, so was the city of Berlin. It was a very exciting place to be, but it was also a very uh, bubbling, boiling pot of uh, espionage, which everyone loves when they watch those films with Len Dayton and Michael Caine, that kind of thing. But uh, a military garrison of around about 10,000 men and armored cars and some tanks, not a lot, uh, that the Allies had between the French, American and British forces. And then obviously the Soviet sector too, which was just an extension of what they were doing in East Germany. So they might have had uh, the same amount of troops maybe in East Berlin itself, but the, the city itself was surrounded by tens of thousands of crack troops of uh, the Red Army, which would then become the Warsaw Pact later on. And as you can see from these photos on the left-hand side, uh, this is what we're going to talk about. And the next slide is why would East Germans be unhappy and want to move? Because ultimately the Berlin Wall was came about because of people power and people power moving from east to west. So where you have uh, repression, political repression that was going on in the east, which mirrored what was going on in Eastern Europe as a whole, lots of uh, East Germans uh, unhappy with that, but then also unhappy with the state of their country. Uh, many years after the war had finished. So you've got the top photo shows you uh, one of the main thoroughfares uh, in West Berlin, the Kudam, which is everything you'd want uh, a reconstructed city to be post-war, bright lights, big city, lots of business, lots of consumer success. You can buy things that you want to whenever you want to, and you have the money that you're earning from a strong economy to buy those things. Whereas on the Eastern side, if you go two or three streets away from the main thoroughfares that had been reconstructed uh, in East Berlin, which as these Germans were liking to say is their Hauptstadt, their, their capital, uh, you would find this. So this, the country was still under and still had to go through major reconstruction, uh, which was in short supply because obviously the Russians had taken, shipped back and taken everything that was nailed down back to Russia at the end of the war to obviously build, rebuild their shattered Western half of their country, which the, the, the German army had destroyed. So uh, you've got a country in East Germany of about 17 million people. And by August 61, when the wall had gone up, 2.1 of the 2.1 million of them had uh, fled, had escaped uh, through the loophole that was the, uh, the, the, the allied uh, Soviet sectors, which up until that time, up until the Berlin Wall was made, uh, weren't policed heavily. So the bottom left-hand sh shot is of the French sector going into the Russian sector. And as you can see, if, if you're very careful with how you promote what you're doing and you're just literally looking like you're, you're crossing a city as, as back then anyone would as we do today we cross the cities all the time or uh, the places where we live to either go to work go to a doctor's appointment take the cat to the vet drop the kids off at school go shopping whatever you're never monitored and, and Berlin was pretty similar there wasn't it wasn't a hard border there wasn't a huge police uh, restrictive security presence so if, like I said, if you were careful, you could get across quite easily unmolested. And as you see with the photo on the right hand side, you'd end up at one of the, the main allied refugee camps, which were in all the sectors. So thousands were crossing every month. And this was just ratcheting up uh, right up until August 61 as the international tension was building up. So like I said, because Khrushchev had taken over from Stalin, once JFK, John F. Kennedy had, had uh, taken over, had won the presidency of the United States, that pressure was building up even more so because uh, Khrushchev had a summit with him. They went head to head. He really uh, berated and bullied uh, the young US president. And both sides came away from their summit in Vienna having completely opposing views of the other. Uh, with JFK, he seemed to think this guy really does mean business and he's prepared to go into some kind of 
either localized or major conflict over the issue of Berlin and what the allied rights of, of freedom and travel would be to that. Whereas Khrushchev came away thinking, I've got this kid's number, kid is the word, uh, I've been able to bully him for the last two days, I think we can get away with what we're going to do. He clearly doesn't want to give me what I want in terms of making Berlin a neutral city and eventually solving our problem with this mass migration. If I don't do something quick within the next six to nine months, I'm being told by the East German authorities, you know, their economy is going to be collapsing. So that's where the issue from June 61, those couple of months up until the wall gets built, that's where the main decisions were taken that Operation Rose, as it would be called, would happen. So this is on the day itself, August 13th, a uh, quiet day chosen deliberately over the weekend. A lot of Berliners were holidaying themselves, selling themselves on the lakes or in the forests that circa, circled around the city. Uh, a lot of them were in bed just having a nice Sunday morning in. Uh, and that's when tens of thousands of workers and what you can see here, tens of thousands of factory fighters or you know the, the East German dad's army equivalent uh, came to the border or just within the border. They're not stupid. They, they, they built the first iteration of the Berlin Wall, barbed wire and cement posts within their own border, probably about 100 to 150 yards. So even if the Allies had wanted to, uh, they would be breaking, violating uh, the agreements they'd had with the Soviets, not with these Germans, but with the Soviets, uh, to go into the Soviet zone to break down these barriers that were being built. And as you can see from the photo behind, the, behind them, they're backed up by two divisions of uh, heavily armed East German regular troops with armored cars and tanks. And then, like I said before, they're surrounded in the city itself by hundreds of thousands of Red Army troops and tanks and aircraft too. So the Allies were really in a spin. And that's why it's a different it's a different subject to talk about. It's a different seminar, but that's why the strategic decision was made over the next few days and coming weeks that a wall, as Kennedy said famously, is a hell of a lot better than a, a war. So as long as the, the Allies were still granted freedom of movement within Berlin itself and they could travel freely unmolested from West Germany across the Autobahn, through the air corridors to their sectors in West Berlin, which wouldn't be lost they could live with that. If it meant the, the East German people themselves were imprisoned, then that's something they could live with. And this is what happened. So we had, uh, I think it's a roughly around 192, 193 streets were blocked off. Uh, 12 U-Bahn and S-Bahn stations were closed. Uh, sewers were blocked off. Uh, and it was an operation that was brilliantly run. You have to say, you have to hand it to these Germans. They, they, they handled this very well. Uh, they, they made sure it, it happened efficiently and quickly within days. And then once the Allies had shown that they weren't prepared to batter down these uh, barbed wire fences, uh, within the next week to 10 days, that's when the first uh, version of the Berlin Wall went up, which was obviously breeze blocks uh, and cement. Uh, but like I said, obviously guarded with armed troops. And within two weeks of that going up, that's when the first shoot to kill uh, event happened, and that's when uh, uh, East Germans knew that uh, A, the war was here to stay for the foreseeable future, and B, their regime were very prepared to, to kill their own citizens to uh, stop them going through it and fleeing to the West. So this is what it looked like. So I, I, it wasn't just a wall that was built through the, the center of town or through the center of Berlin itself. As you can see, they built it all the way around the, the hinterland on the western side of the Allied sectors. Uh, so they're hermetically sealing in uh, the, the Allied sectors, West Berlin, from any kind of uh, uh, possible uh, attempt by East Germans to get into the city that way. So, like I said, it was a very, very successful operation. The old crossing points that are dotted all over the city sectors, there was over 80 of them, had now shrunk down to 13. But like I said, key, the Allies still had their uh, links that had always been agreed that would take you from the West uh, German border through the Autobahn or on the rail links or on the canals that would take you to the, the, the entrance to the Western sectors. So that's where the name Checkpoint Charlie comes from. It was after the wall was built and Checkpoint Alpha would be the, uh, the crossing point for getting you into West, from West Germany into East Germany. Checkpoint Bravo gets you into the, the hinterland through there into the actual allied sectors. And then Checkpoint Charlie was the, the one international militarized crossing point that was agreed upon that would be the main entrance for the allied military uh, diplomats and uh, 
Western media could you could use that crossing point. Uh, the East Germans uh, and East Berliners and the West Germans and West Berliners would have to use other crossing points that are, are dotted on that line, which you can find if you uh, buy my book and have a look at it. It goes into far more detail than we'll go into this talk. Cheekily got that push in. There you go. So now I'll hand over to Jane and we can uh, and uh, have a, a, a nice chat about it. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I think that's a really great sort of backdrop for for talking about the book. But actually, before we get into sort of the book itself, um, you know, I'm, one of the things I was wondering as I was reading it is how you came to this topic yourself. And, you know, from, from what Brendan has said, you had a, had a career, you had a day job. So what was it that... Um, inspired you to to write on this subject and to to write the book uh well my uh kind of long story short uh my father was in uh the british army well uh, on on his side of the family from grandfather great grandfather etc etc so they've all been in the army uh if you're living in northeast scotland you're either in the fishing industry or you joined up uh that was the only way to actually make a living uh so he was in the the armed forces, he was in Korea, and then he was in the British Army of the Rhine. And so when I was growing up, uh, I would hear countless tales of his escapades, and escapades they were, that's a, a different talk as well. Uh, but uh, he loved going to Berlin, West Berlin, I should say, sorry. Uh, he loved the dynamism of the place. And so this is, you know, it sparked an interest for me anyway. And then as I was growing up, I was lucky enough to, to go to Germany in the 70s and 80s, uh, on visits, uh, educational visits, student visits with the scouts as well. And I was also lucky enough to go to Russia. I went to Leningrad as was, obviously it's in Petersburg now. I went there in 1981 on a student exchange. And that sparked an interest in the Cold War. So I'd always had an interest in it. Uh, I did my A-level history. My degree uh, was modern European history. My dissertation was on the Prague Spring. So it's always I've always been fascinated. My career in publishing, uh, obviously, gravitated towards history. I've been really lucky. Uh, I've managed to establish uh, what I think is a good career in, in publishing history books. Very lucky to have worked with some of the best in the business in the UK anyway, and in the US. Uh, and again, I, you know, who wouldn't? You, you, you work with the best. It sparks an interest in you and thinks, oh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to try and write something myself one day. And uh, I had this idea and I, I've always been fascinated by Berlin. I've always been fascinated by the Berlin Wall. Uh, I watched it go up. Uh, sorry, I watched it come, go up. I watched it come down uh, in 89. I was in the last year of my degree. Uh, and this was before 24 hour news and the internet and everything. I was just watching it with my friends in our house, jaw dropping. Because to my, I'm a child of the Cold War. I, I thought uh, that the, the wall's there like the Himalayas. It's never going to go away. Uh, I went over there in 1990 because I, I thought I want to see Germany, well, East Germany and the other countries. I went to Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia as was, uh, because I thought it, it will change. I like to see it before it does, and I did. So there you have it in a nutshell. That, that's, one, that's the main reason. And I, I was lucky enough that uh, I got to do this project. I feel very fortunate. I, I feel super fortunate to have met the people I met to interview. They're, they're the stars of the book, not me. Yeah, I mean, this is the, what I found sort of interesting is that your your interest in the subject comes from hearing the stories of what it was like. And that really comes out in the book, which, you know, you have that sort of the the high political background, you know, that you've given us here, but then it's matched with the stories of people, um, you know, many just sort of ordinary people mm. who were there, mm. who who witnessed the events. And I mean, what was that like interviewing these people, finding these stories? How did you how did you find that that process? Uh, I, I actually I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, I enjoyed the writing, but I, I, I enjoyed the research more because that's it's a detective work, really. And it's really, really enjoyable when you find the people that you really want to find uh, or you discover them by chance, I should say, sometimes, too. Uh, but it was a case of I started off with uh, Obviously, I know the background to the history of the wall, and I know the background of the famous points in the history of the wall. 
So you research, I was researching some of those names and I was finding some of those people I was interviewing them. And as, as, it, as it happens sometimes, it, you interview one person and they'll give you their story. And as you're talking to them, they'll, they'll talk about another thing that happened while they were there. And they'll say, oh, you should talk to such and such. And that leads to an open door. You go through that door and then you meet that person. That could be if you're talking to people in the military or in military intelligence. Uh, and that was, that was fascinating. Uh, and then, I w again, I was lucky enough to get invited. I, I befriended a lot of uh, associations, veterans associations, whether it's the American Berlin Brigade or Bricksmiths or people like that, uh, British Intelligence. And again, they, they were very kind and open with me and wanted to have a chat, uh, very willing to tell me their, 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 their stories, their memories. Uh, and that's where the pressure begins when you're a writer, because you've got all these amazing st stories and it's how you how can you uh, do it justice? How can you make sure that you want it to be a page turner? Because that's it gets back to your point. That's the thing I wanted. I didn't I didn't want to dry. The world does not need another dry history of the Cold War from Ian McGregor. Uh, I'd rather I, I it's, it's in my publishing as well. I'm always more interested in the oral history. Uh, the people that actually were on the ground in a certain time and place that the general reading public would find interesting. And, and, and you have to tell it through those people's memories, their words. And so, yeah, that was really interesting. And then it was down to me to decide how I wanted to do it. And my, and my, my goal for the book always was I want to tell a very balanced uh, view from all sides. I don't want it to be just some kind of Western, westernized uh, job on uh what the berlin war was because obviously to other people it means something completely different uh and that's that's the story i wanted to tell because obviously i did meet east germans uh that thought the war was a good thing and they thought the east german state was a great thing uh and they're very sad it's gone and you have to be honest enough to say right well i want to tell that story too yeah and to 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 have the sort of to 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 honor the sort of um all the different voices in a way that does them justice i mean it's not yeah. a not an easy task at all no um now on the screen i think we have an image of one of the people that you talk about is that correct yes so this is uh adolf knackstedt uh he was a sergeant in uh a u.s military intelligence and he has a whole chapter in the book uh because his story, I mean, he, he could literally write a book, not just have a chapter. I mean, I, that would do him more justice, I think. But he was uh, an amazing man I met at, uh, I was at the, uh, the Ber US Berlin Brigade's 70th anniversary uh, commemorations of the Berlin Airlift in Berlin quite a few years ago. And uh, I was one of their guests. And I just, again, it's happen chance. I just happened to be sitting at the commencement meal on the first evening, I was sitting next to Adolf with his wife, Vera, lovely, lovely couple. And just in the two or three hours I sat with them, as a writer and as a historian, you're trying hard not to show how excited you are by talking to this person because you're thinking, I cannot believe no one's told your story before. It's just incredible. So to give the listeners here a very, very short uh, part of the story, He's basically, uh, he's an American born. He, you wouldn't know it to, to listen to him. He's got a very, very thick uh, German accent. Uh, and his family, his parents moved from Germany in the late 20s after the economic crash uh, because of the state of Germ Germany was in, uh, built themselves a life uh, in the Bronx in New York. Uh, but obviously by the beginning of the war, uh, their father wanted to return a, a Volksdeutscher, uh, answer the call of the fatherland, return to defend the country. So, but in, in a very uh, espionage-like way, which I tell about in the book, mm -hmm. they they managed to uh, escape uh, the FBI, who are trying to track them down to put them in an intern an internship camp, which they did to thousands of other uh, American Germans, and they did get back by uh, the summer of 1941. Completely different story, but I'd love to know more about it. Is Adolf's dad then disappeared for the rest of the war and was in the Far East, I think, for the Abwehr. And, uh, the, but the family survived. So uh, Adolf uh, and his family find themselves living in the Soviet sector in Berlin, uh, which they then managed to uh, move across to the American sector by the time of the airlift. 
and his father had by then resurfaced, uh, was working as one of the porters unloading the planes during the airlift at Tempelhof. Uh, but by 19, skip all the way through, by 1954, Adolf was then 80, oh, he'd be 20 by then. He'd had his call up papers because he was still an American citizen. Uh, and so the, the family decided it's the best thing for you in terms of what you're going to do with your life and you have to get out of the city. You can't keep running around stealing contraband to keep the family going. Uh, and that's what he did. He enlisted in the American Army, was in the combat engineers, was about to be assigned to Korea. You and I were talking about that, Jay. Where was he going? Uh, but then they found out, obviously, his background and thought, wow, uh, speaks perfect Berlin dialect. Uh, He's got a great cover story. We need to have him in intelligence. So he then had to return to the US and trained as a spy for about six months uh, in Maryland. And then he, he went in, his, his cover was a civil servant. And right up until the, uh, the wall was built in 61, he's ostensibly a spook. So he'd be in and out, he's living in safe houses around the city. His family would never know one week to the next what he was up to. He was uh, spying on what the East Germans were up to, obviously, in the city and in the hinterland outside the city. He'd be there if any uh, senior political figure or, or figure from the military or police in East Germany defected. Adolf was one of the team that would then debrief them before they were taken back. And he just led an incredible life. And obviously, I talk about him throughout the book because his story is just so amazing. And uh, for instance, uh, obviously, when the wall went up, uh, his job was to go from, you know, skip across from the American, British, French sectors into the, the, the new barricaded sectors by hook or by crook, pretending he was an East German and just reporting back what he was finding because the Allies were in the dark about exactly what are they up to? Well, they're building this barrier, but what do they mean by building this barrier? And Adolf was one of the key voices they were listening to about what, what it meant and what it might entail for the, 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 the Allied garrison. And some of the things he was telling them about, obviously they're building the barriers on the sovereign side of the East German state meant that they, they dialed down the pressure and thought, okay, well, we can, we can live with that. There's what I'd said earlier. But the famous shot, I'll end, I'll end by saying the famous shot where we saw the East German guard, Conrad Schumann, jumping over the barbed wire, which are on a million T-shirts and a million posters. Uh, and that's an East German border guard escaping. Adolf was his bodyguard once he was in West Berlin because the Allied com commanders on the ground were convinced that the, uh, these Germans were going to either try and grab him back or put out a Stasi hit team to kill him because it was such a, a PR coup for the West to have Conrad Schumann there. So uh, Adolf was his bodyguard all the time he was in West Berlin. It was, only, it was only for 24 hours and then he was with him on the flight that took him out to West Germany. And that was one of his other jobs. But I could talk all night about Adolf, but he was just an exceptional man to talk to. Ended up doing two tours of Vietnam, worked in intelligence there, had an incredible life. Now lives, he's retired. He lives on the base in Fort Bragg in their retirement homes. Uh, he's in his early 90s, still going strong. And uh, he was just, like I said, he was an amazing man to meet, as was his wife. And she's in the book, too, because she happened to be on holiday in Berlin in 1989, November, when the wall came down. And she rang Adolf and he answered the phone wondering who was ringing him at night. Uh, and uh, a collect call coming from Berlin, and it was Vera ringing him from a phone box right by one of the checkpoints that had opened. She's got a bottle of champagne in one hand, phone in the other, saying, can't believe it, the wall's coming down. And Adolf was just, you know, the pair of them were in tears. And I try and capture that in the book, too. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad it's interesting to know that you met the um, Adolf and Vera at the same time, because I think this is something that I found really um, fascinating in the book is that, you know, you have this sort of great spy story of, you know, Adolf going back and forth and getting information. But then, you know, he has his wife and child at home, mm -hmm. too, who are, you know, who have their own sort of protocols and code words about what, you know, what to do if, if something happens. And, um, mm -hmm. You know, it puts a very different sort of human face on, you know, what could otherwise be a really sort of, um, you know, spy story like, you know, yeah. we're talking about John le Carre. Yeah, well, that, that, that's the thing. That, that's what I try and tell is there was if you take away the excitement and the, the terror of that impactful moment of over the first few weeks, the walls going up and what's going to happen and... Mm. The, the civilians that I talked to, Adolf that I talked to, and uh, a lot of the American and British uh, allied personnel that I talked to, a lot of them had families in the city at the time. Uh, the Lieutenant Werner Pike, who I, I talk again about in the book 
quite a lot. He's, he's the guy that's at Checkpoint Charlie during the, stand, the tank standoff. His wife had just had twins and he's racing towards uh, uh, the checkpoint when the tanks are going head to head uh, a few months after the wall's gone up. You know, the, the American garrison didn't know how this was going to end. And he's thinking what, you know, part of him was feeling guilty about why, why have I got my family here? I shouldn't have my family here. And as you said, with, with Adolf, yeah, I mean, he grabbed time with his family when he could. And it was obviously asked no questions. Uh, when he first was uh, an active operative in Berlin, his family actually didn't even know he was in Berlin. They, he, he'd been there for three weeks already on the job before he, he felt it was safe enough to actually go and tap on the door to go and speak to his, uh, his parents and then his wife. So, yeah, I mean, that's the sacrifices people, people made. And that's what I, again, that's what I try and capture in the book. Yeah. And I, I mean, also the, that, um, you know, you can follow the life trajectory because some of these people are in their early twenties, you know, they're quite young um, in that post-war era when the wall goes up. So they, you know, they experience all of it and sort of, you know, that ability to, to reflect mm. on that, you know, that whole mm. process and that whole period. Yeah. Um, yeah, rather than a sort of a specific, just a specific moment as well, yeah. I think quite interesting as well. Yeah, so I mean, that's what I try and capture. I, I, mm. Obviously, it's, a, it's one book. You could do volumes if you're going to properly assess everyone's yeah. kind of, all the major incidents and, and lots and lots more uh, human stories. It, like, yeah, it could easily be that kind of thing. But mm. I try to capture all the main moments, but then also try and get some unusual moments and, and, and some ordinary voices amongst the, the more famous voices because, mm. you know, as you just said, people did live there. There was an everyday life to be getting on with. People still had to go to work <laughs> and raise children and that kind of thing. So that that needed to be discussed too. Yeah. Um, the other person who I wanted to talk about is, is this woman, Margaret Hosseini. Um, and I found her story throughout, you know, she again, like Adolf, you, ha you have her in the, you know, almost the very first chapter. Mm. Um, and then she sort of recurs throughout. And I mean, she had sort of one of them, for me, one of the most, um, you know, emotionally heart wrenching um, stories in, in the book, but also sort of one of the more, more amusing ones, uh, yeah, you know, when yeah. we're talking about JFK. So I was wondering yeah. if you could just say some more about well, her. Yeah, she's, she's, she's in her eighties now. So I, I love this photo of her. She hasn't got many photos. And, well, she has, but she wouldn't give me any, but uh, I, I, and I understand why, because she had to live through a period where she was under surveillance from the Stasi, that kind of thing. And those, those kind of habits don't die away. So, but this is a, a photo I got from a, from an interview in the late 80s, early 90s. But yeah, she's fascinating. Uh, she lives in London. She was the very first person I interviewed for the book. So I've interviewed nearly 80 people. She was the very first one and she couldn't have been more welcoming and uh, accommodating. I went to her house two or three times and it was a, an emotional series of interviews because of what she'd gone through. So again, very quickly, uh, she, uh, her father was a diplomat, German diplomat. He'd, he'd been uh, stationed in France uh, during the, the first few years of reconstruction in France after the war. He moved the family back to Berlin because a lot of their extended family lived in Berlin. Uh, ironically, that most of them lived in East Berlin. Uh, and he wanted to connect the family back there. And obviously by the time they moved back, 52, I think it was, uh, the reconstruction of West Berlin was well underway. So, you know, they were, they, they were living in, in, in uh, nice accommodation. But what I tried to capture through the eyes of uh, Margit was uh, she was regularly, like I said, going to East Berlin to see relatives and uh, friends. And through her eyes, I managed to really describe, I hope vividly, the state of East Berlin uh, in the 1950s in terms of the, 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 the incredible damage that was still there from the Allied bombings during the war and then obviously the Red Army taking the city itself in, uh, in April 45. All of East Berlin was very, very much like that, as I showed you in an earlier photograph. Uh, but then obviously by 53, which again is another story, is the, the Berlin uprising, uh, the East Berlin uprising, I should say, which became the East German uprising, which was brutally suppressed by the Russians and Russian tanks, which survived, which ensured the survival of the East German regime. 
she witnessed the after effects of that and what it had done to the housing and some of her friends, uh, her parents' friends had disappeared. So she got a bird's eye view as a child about what was going on in East and West Berlin and the differences that were occurring socially, politically, economically. And again, that really uh, runs through the pages of, of the first half of my book because that, I, I got it first person from her. But incredibly, she witnessed so many uh, internationally recognized historical events. So she obviously uh, uh, witnessed the wall going up. And I tell this heartrending story of her father bursting into her bedroom because what had happened was her younger sister had been staying the weekend. Uh, it had been planned. She was staying with uh, her, uh, I think it was her uncle and auntie uh, in north northeastern Berlin, uh, as she did all the time. And so the family were terrified. They're thinking, well, the barriers are going up. Are we ever going to see our daughter again? And that's the, the first thing she knew about was her, her father bursting in to tell her this. They had to rush down to Friedrichstrasse and uh, weirdly, uh, on both sides they all congregated towards Friedrichstrasse because there's massive humanity there uh, to try and find a civil servant or someone from the council that could uh, give them some news or maybe a policeman and by a, a miracle they did find her sister because her relatives had had the same idea that we need to get down to the center of the city and maybe we'll be able to to get her back through the barriers and that's what happened but that she was, witnessed... uh, that was incredible yeah <laughs> i mean really that they could do that it, like, i mean was... needle in a haystack and it, yeah. and it happened so i capture that scene of reconciliation but then i capture her sense of as as it was from all Berl west berliners of of paranoia uh, isolation and being the feeling that they'd been uh, is uh they'd been left betrayed almost by the allies specifically america i suppose because they're the ones holding the power uh, that they weren't going to do anything about what these Germans had done. And, and what a lot of people forget as well is that uh, the Russians and these Germans were constantly cutting off the electricity and gas supplies uh, in West Berlin once the first barrier had gone up, just as a, some kind of psychological ploy to even more ratchet up the tension. So she capt I captured that from the interviews. She saw JFK uh, give his speech and she gave me a totally different version of what it was like. She wasn't thinking this is the most amazing speech I've ever heard and how lucky I am to be here to witness it. She was just so terrified of the press of people, the tens of thousands of people that were squeezed into this small square. And she was saying, I, was, I thought I was gonna get crushed to death and I was pushing and shoving and scratching people just to try and get out of it. Just because I, I just I couldn't believe we'd all come here to listen to this and that's that's the kind of uh, angle I got I got from her and then tragically she was a witness she uh, to the one of the main stories I talk about of of uh, the shoot to kill policy that the East Germans had is the young East German bricklayer who's 18 years old Peter Fechter who was shot and killed well shot and and left to bleed to death in the no man's land of the death strip uh, the early first uh, version of the death strip and no one would go and help him because the Americans couldn't go because he was shot inside East German territory in no man's land. The East Germans hadn't been given a command by their, their main officer to go and do something. So he just cried out and bled to death. And uh, Margit witnessed this because she was in a building overlooking the death strip at a party that, that, that had been there that night. And as, as teenage parties are, a lot of people just hung around until the, until the dawn and, and, and they witnessed the shooting. And that was one of the emotional interviews I had with her. She, you know, the tears were flowing and, and you could still see it just instantly switched her back to, uh, I think, August uh, 62 of when it, when it happened. And again, you, you want to do justice to that kind of story because it's, it's, it should be told. You know, it's, it's, uh, Peter Fechter's got the memorial around the corner from Friedrichstrasse and Zimmerstrasse. And it, it's a lovely thing. But... People I was talking to when I was at Checkpoint Charlie, especially those naughty reenactors who don't know a thing about what they're talking about, they're just there to get a photograph. Uh, I was asking them, what do you think about the Peter Fechter Memorial? It's, it's such an amazing thing what they've done now. And no one knew what I was talking about. And that's, but so to talk to Margit and capture the story, I think was uh, one of the most important things I wanted to do in the book was tell that story correctly. Yeah, well, and definitely, I think, you know, reading that, I, you know, it is it is just sort of really gut wrenching to read, you know, because it's a, a horrific thing to have witnessed. But, you know, you can get a sense of just sort of her, how 
sort of angry she was that no one did anything and that inability yeah. to do something herself i mean yeah. it's really yeah, yeah i mean it's it was a helplessness as well yeah it was the, the it was she realized obviously the civilians were helpless they they couldn't mm -hmm. affect change and they couldn't do anything to these germans and the soviets but she was talking about to then look down and witness the americans through no fault of their own they they couldn't have done anything uh, it would have caused an international incident but uh to witness that really brought home to her how uh, impotent the whole situation was in Berlin. And that's one of the main reasons she then thought, I, I've got to get out of here. I, I, I want a life. Uh, and I'll, be, I'll be very quick, but it's such a brilliant anecdote. So when I, I was talking to her, she, she eventually migrated to London and was living in London. And I said to her, obviously I have interest, I live in London. I said, oh, where did you live? And she said, Hyde Park. And I was like, wow, Hyde Park. Mm. That's amazing. You're living in Hyde Park. She says, no, no, no. I was living in Hyde Park and I said, wow, well, what did you do? She said, well, I just, I just lived rough in the bushes for three weeks because uh, I didn't have much money. And I didn't know th that many people. And uh, it was only by luck uh, when I was getting really desperate, I managed to get a job as a cleaner in the uh, West German embassy in London. Mm -hmm. And, but she's such an incredible woman. And, and you look at her and she ended her career as the cultural attache to the West German embassy in Bonn. And she had a career of not just from uh, that point of view in the embassy, she was one of the focal points for East German dissidents that were escaping the mm -hmm. system through the late 60s and the 70s and the 80s. She was one of the people that would be helping them, supporting them in London, as well as Western Europe, if she needed to, to go there. So, again, that's one of the reasons why she wasn't too keen on advertising herself, which I can understand. I mean, I think it's OK now, mm -hmm. but... Uh, Old habits die hard, like I was saying, but yeah, incredible one. Wow, yes, I mean, really incredible. Um, I think we have a very little time left for us to talk before we hand it over to the Q&A, but I think given that today is the day of German unity, mm. um, you know, I wondered what, uh, you've done these what did you say 80 interviews almost yeah it's roughly 80 yeah so what I mean what do you think your interview participants would be thinking about today or you know how how are they yeah how are they feeling well, about, I mean, about today yeah I, I was going to say uh, on the west german side definitely on the west german side uh I would I would be amazed if there's no if the tears aren't falling because a lot of the interviews I conducted face to face obviously uh, quite a few of them in Berlin, uh, in cafes and restaurants and that kind of thing. Uh, and every time we got to a moment in their story uh, where it's about human loss or the suffering of missing relatives and friends and the sacrifices you make by escaping east to west and what you're giving up uh, in terms of never seeing them again or thinking you're never going to see them again, they would start crying. And when we get to the part of their memories about when the wall came down and the country's unifying, that again, that, that's when the tears were flowing. Uh, and it's hard not to, you know, uh, join in. Uh, so I, I would be amazed. I'm sure, yeah, there'd be a lot of East Germans that I talked to that again would have that same uh, emotion. Uh, but there would definitely be some East Germans that were in the book that I interviewed that obviously were part of the establishment, part of the, the system of guarding the border or in the Stasi themselves, security forces, that would be emotional, but for completely different reasons. Mm -hmm. For what they've lost or they think they've lost and or for what they think was given up without a fight. And again, that's that's uh, a key thing that I try and capture in the book of potentially what could have happened mm -hmm. uh, if the hardliners are taking control in November 89 and we had what what was called then the Chinese solution yeah. uh, to uh, civilians that are trying to get through the checkpoints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on that note, I think I'm going to be passing it back to Brendan, who is going to uh, coordinate the Q&A. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ian and Jane. Uh, we do have a, a few questions and some comments, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw them out there for you. So, uh, Paul uh, Reger at our, our festival, going to hear you again, Paul. Paul says, great to hear the reenactments have been banned. They were an obscenity. Uh, and he was going to ask you about your reaction to it. I think you, you made that clear. But perhaps you could expand on how this pantomime was gotten rid of. 
Uh, I think it was uh, from what I'd read in the, the the press from a distance. I think uh, I mean reenactment's great. Don't get me wrong. Uh, if a lot of the reenactors I've met in on you know various festivals that I go to because obviously I publish history books. I go to Chalk Valley History Festival, that kind of thing. Reenactors are fantastic people, and and the, especially the. The, the, the ones that I meet anyway, they really know their subject, they've really read up on it, they're proud of what they do, all their equipment's correct, they pride, yeah, they pride themselves on it. Whereas these guys, and it's, again, it's not their fault, they're just doing a job, but it's, you know, they could be serving coffee around the corner for all they care. Uh, so I've, I've, I've met them several times and uh, yeah, to, I, I never met one of them that had anything really to say, to have a constructive conversation on the history of, of the place, uh, Berlin itself, to the point of, I could tell I was annoying them because they wanted to get on with earning some money and, and getting their photograph taken with the tourists that wanted to uh, uh, stand alongside them. And from a tourist perspective, I can understand why they'd want to do it. I mean, you want to do it, don't you? you, want, you know, I, I've been to Checkpoint Charlie, I've stood by the, the, uh, the, the shed, and stood by the American guards smiling back. But yeah, I mean, you can go somewhere else to get that. It's like Disneyland, isn't it? I mean, the shed itself isn't even the, the original. Uh, you know, that, 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 that went a long time ago. Uh, and that's a shame. Checkpoint Charlie Museum nearby is very good. I think that's very educational. It's, if it was educational, great. And so those complaints must have gone to the, the local councils. And I'd, I'd read before lockdown that they were going to take steps to, uh, to ban the practice. And that's what they've done. So I think it's a good thing. Thank you. Uh, David asks, uh, did those East Germans who reached the West, uh, the refugee centres you mentioned, did they, did they have to stay in Berlin or were they able to continue on to Western Europe? Yeah, they only stayed very briefly. So there's a, the Marienthalder uh, refugee centre uh, is very good. It's a, it's a working museum now. So I, if anyone's going to Berlin on holiday, I'd recommend definitely go there. It gives you a really amazing... Uh, history of the place and the people that passed through. But no, they, they would, it was literally a passing through center. Uh, you wouldn't be there that many days. Uh, there was blocks of flats and apartments all around the, the, the refugee center itself. Uh, the main thing really was you had to get processed. So the vast amount of people that were going through there would quickly be put on a train and you're going off to the West for a new life. Uh, but like I was saying about Adolf Nachsted, uh, if you were in the military police or civil authorities uh, of a certain stature, I suppose, you had to stay there and be debriefed. Uh, and you may be there for a long time, depending on who you were. Uh, or if you were super important, you'd be, you'd be flown out very quickly to go to, there was a, a American intelligence had a, 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 a camp specifically to debrief uh, East German military and, uh, and uh, politicians. Uh, in West Germany, and that's where you would go. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. If the Berlin Wall was in Berlin, why didn't these Germans who wanted to escape go further out into the countryside to cross the boundary line into West Germany? You touched well, that upon that about the wall circle. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, that, that was the problem. Up, up until about 1952, 53, they could have done uh, because it, it, there was a wall. I mean, obviously, Churchill made his big speech about the Iron Curtain. It hadn't actually come into effect by then uh, when he made that speech in the late 40s. But uh, no, by the time the airlift had, 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 had failed uh, and then you had the East German uprising in 1953, uh, that's when uh, it was decided that they really had to have a, a proper hard border. And by hard border, I mean electrified fences, very high barbed wire, but whole whole sections of, of uh, militarized uh, pathways to even get to the border. So by, by the time the wall came down in 89, you, it, I think it was three, at least three or four kilometers worth of, of uh, guarded territory you'd have to get through but even before you got to that wall. In some places they had minefields, they had guard dogs, they had tracks for motorized uh, border guards too. Helicopters were flying over continually, so practically impossible. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, were there telephone or other communication links between the two sides of the city? Yeah, yeah, I mean, by, by 89, yeah, there was, there was communication everywhere. One of the stories I tell towards the end of the book is during the night of the wall opening, uh, the British Commandant Robert Corbett 
uh, rescued the Russian garrison that was inside the British sector that guarded uh, the Russian war memorials, about 40 or 50 of them. And West Berliners were trying to scale the, the, the fences to attack them. And he got the West Berlin police there to, to guard them and save them. But as he was leaving to go and sort the next problem out that night, because obviously people were coming through the barriers, he got phoned uh, by his superior saying, what the hell have you been doing? And he said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, what did you do at the tear garden? And he explained to them. And they said, well, uh, a secret channel of communication that was opened uh, right up until Stalin personally closed it under his orders at the end of the airlift that hadn't been opened since has just opened an hour ago and the head of the uh, the Warsaw Pact forces has sent a message naming you saying the war the Red Army won't forget what you've done for us this night so that just goes to show from the high to the low there was there was definitely uh, communications East Germans found out that the, the checkpoints were opening from West Berlin radio and TV that was reporting the news they, they didn't get it through their own channels. I have to emphasize that. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, Beverly uh, says, uh, brilliant talk, and she's going to be going out to buy a copy of your book. And I'm sure you're glad to hear that. Uh, like myself, she's old enough to remember the wall. Well, sorry, she said she remembers the wall. She remembers the wall going up. I'm not quite that old yet. Uh, and <laughs> it going down. And she says, one of her favorite movies is Billy Wilder's One, Two, Three but she wonders if anyone understands it anymore. And what would you say about the present state of public consciousness? I don't know if you know that film. I don't actually, I was, I was uh, no, I'll have to, have to look that up. Uh, I know quite a few others, but uh, yeah, I mean, well, I, I give a lot of these talks I give to colleges and uh, sixth forms uh, that are studying the Cold War for history. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, what I get from them anyway is there's, a, there's an appreciation, they, under, they understand the basics. But that gets back to why I wanted to capture so many voices in the book. They don't know really the human side because all three of us grew up in the Cold War to some degree uh, and we remember what it was like. Uh, so trying to uh, reflect that to students, it can be difficult, uh, but that's why I, I constantly just talk about the human stories when I'm giving the presentation and say, you know, you, you'll you get the strategy because you'll need to know that for your A-level exam, but you really need to know the personal stories because that's that's where the reality is, in my opinion. Thank you. Of course, are there many remnants of the original wall still visible in Berlin? Or is there a drive to obliterate all traces other than the official memorials? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, there was a... There's a few, I remember there was a few hundred yards of wall discovered in some big, obviously, bushes and trees that had grown up around it. That was discovered a couple of years ago, I remember, in the, in the southwest of the city, I think, uh, on the border. But generally, yeah, the, 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 yeah, nearly all the wall's gone, other than the, 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 the few pieces you'll see in the tourist areas. Uh, and then, obviously, there's, there's all the other pieces of the wall in the souvenir shops. Uh, but I, I've actually got a piece of it. I, 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 it's around the corner, but it's on my shelf. Uh, one of the Royal Military Police uh, guys that I interviewed really kindly gave me a piece that he collected, uh, and I treasure that. So I've got that on my my shelf. As many a doubler has a piece of Nelson's column. Uh, there you go. Way, similar way. Well, uh, many. No, sorry, go on. Ben, ben asks, uh, did your conversations with former East Germans provide any insight? into why the far right is so strong in parts of East Germany at the moment? Uh, the, well, the only thing I, I could say is, it, it, I suppose that kind of politics, uh, extreme politics, plays into people that feel like they've been forgotten, overlooked. Uh, economically, they're failing because obviously, they, I mean, you, you look at the statistics from old East Germany compared to uh, West Germany now, uh, there's still a migration of workers going to to the, the old West Germany because you'll, you'll have a, a better chance of the job you want, better pay, that kind of thing. Uh, the infrastructure of East Germany still is a work in progress. I mean, East Germany was always more agricultural than West Germany anyway. The, the heavy industry and uh, consumer industry was always in the West anyway. So they've still got to build back from that. It's getting there. And, and I mean, Berlin, if, amazing city now the reconstruction that's gone on there over the last 20 30 years uh, it's, it's you know so if that can if what they've done for berlin can be reflected in how they can keep building up the east german infrastructure great but yeah there were, 
a lot, and you've got to remember, a lot of the people that I was talking to were part of the regime. So they still hanker for it. So there's a, a bit of it. But in terms of, yeah, 20, 30 year olds who are drifting towards right wing politics in East Germany, I mean, it's, I, I would argue it's economically driven. And uh, the, old, the old arguments about migration into their country, people taking jobs that should be theirs. I mean, it's, it's just the old red rag to a bull, isn't it? Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Colin uh, has a, a commentary that a uh, story his partner witnessed the wall going up on the Sunday morning with her grandfather. She's going from west to east and did not return until 1976. Wow. So she spent her youth close to Erfurt and witnessed a Soviet deserter being shot in the back while trying to escape. And in order to return, she had to be interviewed by the Stasi and a file opened where she was described as, quote, troublesome. <laughs> and they now, they now have that file. Uh, she also witnessed the Stasi break into her home and search it. They were dressed as clowns. <laughs> um, so there's, there's an eyewitness again. Uh, wow. Colin, really brings it over, doesn't it? The, yeah. the, the, you know, the, the, some of the ridiculousness of it in some, in some ways, but uh, the real effect, real effect it had on, on people's lives. Well, w w one of the real dystopian things I think that I, I, I uh, was told that the Stasi would do if they're interrogating you, they, they, they take your sweat uh, yeah. because they'll, they'll give it to the dogs if they ever have to chase you. I mean, that's just, who thinks like that? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. It's astonishing, really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, uh, folks, it's, uh, we've come to the, the, the end of the hour. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who took part in today's Festival of History event uh, run by Dublin City Council. All of you who asked uh, questions and gave us your, your stories. Obviously, I'd like to thank uh, Ian and Jane very much for uh, their contributions.